Well, go with me again to Leviticus chapter 20. Leviticus chapter 20, verse 26 is our theme scripture for this lesson, the spirit of truth and the spirit of error, the spirit of truth and the spirit of error. In Leviticus 26, 20, it says, and you shall be holy to me, for I, the Lord, am holy and have separated you from the people's that you should be mine. Hallelujah. Father, we thank you that you entrusted us, that you have separated us to yourself, that everything that we need is in you. Everything that we are is in you. Let us be wholly separated to you in our actions, in our words, Father, that we can be everything you've called us to be, to fulfill everything that you have purposed our lives to be in Jesus' name. So we can hear, well done, good and faithful steward on that day. Amen? Amen. Praise the Lord. The spirit of truth and the spirit of error. Yeah, and I, I've said this before, but when are we you know, and it really is our responsibility. But when are we, the church of Jesus Christ, going to start rejecting the spirit of air and a watered-down gospel, a watered-down word of God? I mean, we have to make the choice. We have, to, we have to demand it. You know, it's interesting that if the church will rise up, and encourage the Christian television stations to put on preachers who preach the word uncompromised and tell them that we will support them in prayer and with our finances if they will get the word on uncompromised, that Christian television will start to revert itself. Do you know when Christian television became of age in the the late 70s and the early 80s? There were preachers. There were people that were preaching the word uncompromised. And there were some people that had great vision. Paul and Jan Crouch, um, Joni and uh, Marcus Lamb. People that had great vision for taking this uncompromised gospel into the world. But if the church is willing to, to hear a compromised gospel, the church is willing to accept that, that God heals Sometimes when it's his will, if we're willing to compromise to that, that's what we're going to hear. You know, I have made some channel choices with which Christian television stations I watch. And for that very purpose, I don't want the word watered down. At some time, babies have to grow up and stop drinking the milk of the word. We need to know what the Bible says so that we can live overcoming lives. You know, there are thousands of churches across America supporting things like abortion, sex selection, governmental authoritarianism, the broken family, racism, and revamping of traditional biblical values. They call themselves Christians. They say they're part of the the body of Christ. They, They say that they're Protestant churches. But 1 Timothy 4, 1 and 2 tells us that the Spirit expressly says that in the last days, some will depart from the faith. They'll leave the truth of the Word. Giving heed to deceiving spirits and doctrines of demons, speaking lies in hypocrisies, having their own minds, their own conscience seared with a hot iron. I believe this is evident that we have entered into those latter times. I believe that we are living in the latter days that Paul wrote Timothy about. That we have entered a time when the deceiving spirits and the damnable doctrines have become commonplace in the American church and in the church around the world. That nations who used to uh, proclaim that their reliance on God 
When you look around the, the globe now, you're seeing countries who are arresting people for praying silently outside of death centers. Praying for those individuals who are going to be going through a process that is going to, to hurt them uh, emotionally without ever saying a word out loud, but just simply kneeling in prayer. And sometimes just standing in prayer, being arrested for silently praying. And don't think in America we're not on the cusp of those days. This generation is growing more deceived and more blinded to the promises that God has for us. People are willing to accept sinfulness, having their own consciences cauterized by the spirit of this world. You know, things that we used to think were unconscionable 40 years are now commonplace. I mean, who would have ever thought that a political party would have stood up and removed God from their platform in America? Isaiah 5.20 says, Woe to those who call evil good and good evil, who put darkness for light and light for darkness, who put bitter for sweet and sweet for bitter. Thank God that some Protestant churches and even Catholic congregations are beginning to wake up. But we have to press in. We cannot allow doctrines, we cannot allow outside influences to to seek into the church and destroy that which God has begun. We have churches now beginning to stand up for religious rights, parental rights, biblical family values, unity of ethics, and protecting children. Who, even two years ago, who would have thought that we would need to, to rise the church up in a short period of time to stand against these type of things? How, how quickly this evil has tried to overtake our nation. But we are standing as intercessors. We are standing in the gap. We are standing between good and evil. This is not a time to be wondering if you have your spiritual armor. This is a time to be fully equipped and ready at a moment's notice. You know, when the early church faced persecution, it responded with prayer, with sanctification, and it responded with the supernatural. If you remember, in the book of Acts, Peter was arrested He was bound and put in jail, and he was uh, being guarded by multiple garrisons. I believe it was four garrisons that were guarding him. He was in chains. He was between, you know, two, you know, uh, guards there, chained up. And and the, the church was in prayer. And the Spirit of the Lord came, and and the busted the bonds that held Peter and released him from the prison. The church was in prayer and Peter comes to the house and knocks on the door. And out comes the little girl. And he says, hey, it's me, Peter. And she doesn't believe him. No, hey, it's me, Peter. And she goes back and says, hey, Peter's, there's somebody that says they're Peter. He's out there knocking on the door. And they didn't believe her. They were living in a time of the supernatural. Why? Because they they consecrated themselves. They prayed. They sought the face of God. They were different than the world. And the supernatural was released in their midst. Thank God Peter got in. Amen? Praise the Lord. That's the day that we're living in. We're living in the day of the opportunity of supernatural. God is looking for a church. He's looking for a people who are willing to pay the price. So we need to get back to being that supernatural church. That's us. The book of Acts should be a mirror for us. We are today's supernatural church. We need to embrace the spirit of truth. 
our spiritual connection to God, and we need to abhor this new age spiritism. We have to stand in the gap because I can tell you it has infiltrated the church. It has infiltrated those who, who, who call themselves Christians. If you look at the things that they watch on TV, the things that they go to, the things that they do, it's hard to tell the Christian from the person living in the world. It's hard to sometimes tell sinner from saint. The only reason we know the difference is they show up on Sunday. It's time to quit lusting after the spectacular while we're missing the supernatural. And that's really what has happened. Television has brought about the the spectacular, and we're seeing a great wave in the the younger generations being drawn to the spectacular, and what it's doing is it's quenching the supernatural of God. To this, we have to become a supernatural church, where signs and wonders and miracles are, are wrought. Not only inside this building, I'm not talking about the church when you look at this building, I'm talking about us. I'm talking about the people of God, the ecclesia, those who are called out of the world system, the church, the ecclesia. We are supposed to be that. Laying hands on the sick. Praying for supernatural revelation, intervention, supernatural deliverance, the divine uh, connections. That's who... We're to be. We have got to become the supernatural church. When we begin to call the spirit of air out for what it is, the church will transform. It will become a place that propels biblical truth. It will become a place that will take works like we talked about last week, works of sorcery and works of witchcraft and works uh, of uh, the demonic, and prevent them from becoming bestsellers instead of promoting them to be bestsellers. The church, you and me, need a Holy Spirit transformation. Each one of us needs a deeper Relationship. We need a stronger in filling. We need a greater anointing. We need to be the ones who can hear the spirit of truth and be able to point out the spirit of error. We need to be the ones who can look at something and feel the check of the Holy Spirit that there's something wrong here. This is not right. We need to be the ones. There have been times in my life that I have entered into a place or had contact with a person. And the spirit on the inside of me, in fact, is it would have been probably about 1996. I remember that we were at a church and after church, Um, this person came up to me and they were bubbly. They they were on fire, it appeared. They were going to do this and do that. And I just got this, this check in my spirit and this word in my mind that said, Flake! Thank God for the spirit of truth. Because the person turned out to be an absolute flake. And of course, because of the ministry we'd been in, they were like, oh, you can help us do this and you can help us do that. But boy, we need the Holy Spirit in our life. We need to know the spirit of truth. We need to be a powerful church. We are called as a church to be that. We're called to be set apart. You know, this word that that the Bible uses, set apart, means it's like this. It's like, I'm here with the world. This here is the world, right? But God's over there, and he's saying, hey, look, I want you to be in the world, but not of it. So I want you to be able to touch the world over here, but I want you to come over here to me. I want you to be set apart. I don't want you to let the world rub off on you. I need you to rub off on the world. 
We need to be set apart. The problem is, is most Christians want to see how close they can get to the world and still have, have relationship with God. How close can I get over here and still be a Christian? How close can I get over to here and still make it through the pearly gates? Go with me to Leviticus 20 and 7. In Leviticus 20 and 7, the Lord says, Consecrate yourself. That means set yourself apart. Therefore, and be holy, for I am the Lord your God. See, God is looking for a people who want to have fellowship with Him. Who want to be like Him. Who want to be able to receive the things that He has designed you to receive. The the, the person that God has designed you to be. God will allow us to be whoever we choose to be. But do you know that when He designed you, He created you for good and not bad? He created you for a hope and a future. So we need to consecrate ourselves. We need to separate ourselves unto God. Yeah, but my friends are all going to the bar, and I'm not going to drink, but I'm going to hang out with them, you know, and I, I, I'm not, I don't smoke anymore, but, you know, I may lean over and take a, take a couple real deep breaths, because, man, I miss that. But that's okay. I'll be on church on Sunday. I'll be on church on Wednesday night or Thursday night here, and, you know, I'll be there. I just, you know, I just want to be with my friends. Reminds me of a story one time. We had somebody come into the church here. And they said, the Lord has brought me here. First off, that for me is a warning sign, right? That is a warning sign. I love the day when God actually sends people here. Amen? But when they come in and pat you on the back and say, the Lord has sent me here to be with you. And then two weeks later, Pastor, the Lord sent me somewhere else. Well, man, the Lord is schizophrenic. The Lord is double-minded. Well, no, He's not. You know, I get it that, that, that sometimes God moves our station in life. But what happens is people get uncomfortable. They're not willing to pay a price. You've got to be where God called you to go. My wife and I used to drive four and a half hours to church. One way. Well, I can say my wife and I and the guy in the sound booth because he was in the back seat. Four and a half hours, one way. What compels somebody to do that? They're being set apart. They're called someplace. They're going somewhere. They're doing something. They're not focused just... It would have... It would have been, and it had been for years, so much easier just to drive down the road to the church. But that's not where God needed us. That's not where God assigned us. And it was uncomfortable, and it was costly, but we have to really determine whether or not we're going to be sold out for God or if we're just going to play church. Amen? So go with me to Leviticus 21 and 2. Let's go back just a few verses Leviticus 20 1 and 2 so God is talking about being holy being connected with him being engaged with him being set apart for him in Leviticus 21 and 2 it says and the Lord spoke to Moses saying again you shall say to the children of Israel whoever of the children of Israel or of the stranger who dwells in Israel who gives any of his descendants to Moloch he shall surely be put to death The people of the land shall stone him with stones. So who is this Moloch? I mean, where did he come from? Who is is Moloch? Moloch is the chief god of the Amorites. He is also an idol of the Canaanites. He's a pagan deity. Well, what in the world does God happen to tell the children of Israel to not have any dealings with pagan deities? I mean, as a pastor, I shouldn't have to come in here and say, quit playing with Satan. You know, quit, quit dancing with the devil. I shouldn't have to say that. But God said, hey, you guys, you've got to stay away from Moloch. He, he, he is, fact is, detestable. 
He was a focus of this pagan worship, and his acts were deeply evil. Very evil. But God had to say to the children of Israel, hey, look, you can't be holy and separated to me. You can't have all the blessings that I have entitled you to and be over here living with pagan gods. You have got to make the choice. Choose you this day whom you will serve. So what was Moloch's big motif? What, did, what was he known for? He was known for infanticide. The killing of babies. Does that sound familiar? It was their form of worship. But not just the killing of babies in this time, because you know they didn't have the, the medical technology of abortion. What they would allow the mother to do is bring forth the baby. Then they would take the baby and lay it on, the, on these arms of this golden cow. It was a, it was a cow figure with human parts, and, and so it had human arms that were designed to cradle a baby. The only thing is that they only laid the baby upon the arms of this golden calf when the fire was enraged and burning, and they literally laid the baby upon the golden calf, burned it to death, and stood and listened to the screams. And God says, you can't have any part of that. It was worship, devotion to this idol and to this idea. Moloch is the god of abortion. He is prevalent today. And that's why God says you can't have any part of him. He is still killing babies that are being sacrificed on the altar of worship by a society, by a church that is bought into these doctrines of demons, this, this calling what is evil good and what is good evil that was t- we were told about and prophesied about. This is not about politics. It's not about any particular elected official. It's not about any party or any platform. But any party or any platform that promotes, supports, or advocates the killing of babies out of the womb or in the womb is practicing under the influence of Moloch. And not long ago, there was a governor on the East Coast that said that we should even allow mothers to bring forth their babies and then, after they're born, make a decision of whether they want to abort the baby or not. That's the spirit of Moloch. And God says, don't have any part of him. Don't have any part of him. I remember, we're a little over time, so I'm not going to go very much longer tonight, but I remember when um, we owned an auto parts store, and I had military clients because we were uh, just south of Fort McCord, Fort Lewis, uh, in Washington State, and a lot of the military people lived in the the Olympia, Lacey, Tumwater areas, and they would travel up uh, to their their stations, and so... uh, we had a lot of clients like that, and I got to know some of them, and I had a chance over the years to invite some of those, those clients. They were customers buying you know, auto parts and stuff. I had a chance to invite them to men's breakfast and to come and, and be a part. And I remember one time that, that I had a, this client. I, I remember them. Him and, his, him and his young wife were from Wisconsin. Now, I was young back then, too. Um, I, 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 I had gray hair, but not near this much. Um, But I remember that he had come in one day, and in the auto parts store, you know, we had these these counters with all of the parts manuals and stuff, because back then, almost nothing was computerized, you know. So when somebody would come in and say, hey, I need a a camshaft for this engine, we'd have to go to the books and look through it. Or if we needed a piston, you had to go through this book and look through it and find the the application. So we had these stools that that were out there, and and whether they say TRW, I think these ones were, were red at the time, these red... Uh, stools that Pastor Tina had found somewhere. I know you guys are surprised that she would have found something like that and brought it into the auto parts store, but she did, uh, praise the Lord. And it was neat because they swiveled. So guys could come in and while they're waiting for you to find the prices and their parts and stuff, you know, they could spin around and go whatever. You know, so. But I remember one day he came in and he just didn't look himself. He was, he was kind of downtrodden, but we were talking and he needed some stuff. And, and I'd asked him, I, I said, you know, what's going on? He goes, you know, he says, we didn't want to tell you because 
we know what, what you believe and, you know, and stuff. He says, but, you know, I took, I can't remember his wife's name, but yeah, I just took her and she had an abortion and, you know, we didn't know what to do. And, and um, you know, and he said, I, I don't feel, I, I just don't even know what to feel. You know, that's what I say. It's, it's like, I don't know whether to feel loss. I don't know whether to feel pain, but I could just tell. Because the world's answer is, take the easy way. They say it's a choice, but we know it's a child. It's the spirit of Moloch that has entered into our society in this area, and it's creeped into the church. And I remember this, this young man, this young military man, that, that he was feeling the effects of it. You can't tell me that it's just a medical procedure. I've had medical procedures. I don't come, feel, come out feeling guilty. I don't come out feeling like, what did I just do? Why did I make that choice? The spirit of error, the spirit of evil, always brings with it consequences, attachments. But once your conscience has been severed or influenced by the spirit of error in one area, you are easily seduced to be errant in your spiritual activities, sin, actions contrary to biblical direction, and the principles are a slippery slope. And I'm going to stop there for time tonight, and we'll pick this up again next week. But we as the church are the hope for this generation. We cannot be afraid to speak the truth. The Old Testament provides for us the shadow, the image for how we're to live in the New Testament. And there's page after page, prophet after prophet, the law, and, and, and that talks about the spirit of error. And we as Christians need to rise up and see that these things that are happening in and around and about us are not just social occurrences, changes in the way we think about things. They are evil spirits. And we need to take authority over them. We need to have the Spirit of God on the inside of us so that we can minister to those who have made wrong decisions and are dealing with the effects of these spiritual consequences. And Father, we thank You I ask, Lord, that you continue to anoint and empower the church, that you particularly empower the church here at Valor Christian Center, that we can bring the good news of Jesus Christ, the saving message of grace, to those who have been deceived, been lied to, accepted the spirit of error, been persuaded by uh, the doctrines of demons and the influence of wickedness. Father, we thank you that we have authority, and we take authority now in Jesus' name as ministers of reconciliation over the power and effects. Satan, we put you on notice that you have no right. You have no right to the people of God or the people of this world that are in our sphere of influence. We claim them saved, healed, set apart, and whole in Jesus' mighty name. Amen.